You were against same-sex marriage, now you're for it. You defended President Obama's immigration policies, now you say they're too harsh. You supported his trade deal dozens of times. You even called it the gold standard. Now, suddenly, last week, you're against it. Will you say anything to get elected? Well, actually, I have been very consistent over the course of my entire life. I have always fought for the same values and principles. Do you think New York State should recognize gay marriage? No. No. Okay. I believe that marriage is not just a bond, but a sacred bond between a man and a woman. I have uh, not uh, supported same-sex marriage. I have supported civil partnerships and uh, contractual relationships. I support marriage for lesbian and gay couples. I support it personally and as a matter of policy and law. So you're saying your opinion on gay marriage changed, or you changed your mind? <laughs> just you trying. know, I really, I have to say, I think you are um, being just, very persistent, but you are playing with my words and playing with what is such an I'm just trying to clarify issue. so I can understand. No, I don't think you are trying to clarify. <laughs> okay. I think you're trying to say that, you know, I used to be uh, opposed and now I'm in favor and I did it for political reasons. And that's just flat wrong. So let me just state what I feel like you are implying and repudiate it. I have a strong record. I have a great commitment to this issue and I am proud of what I've done and the progress we're making. Yeah, I'm just saying, I'm sorry, I, I just want to clarify what I was saying. No, I, I was saying that you maybe really believe this all along, but, you know, believed in gay marriage all along, but felt for political reasons, America wasn't ready yet and you couldn't say it. That's what I was thinking. No, that, no, that is not true. <laughs> it really is great how long you've supported great gay marriage. Yes. I, I could have supported it sooner. Well, you did it pretty soon. Yeah. Could have been sooner. Fair point. <laughs> Just uh, in July, New Hampshire, you told the crowd you, quote, take a backseat to no one when it comes to progressive values. I take a backseat to no one when you look at my record and standing up and fighting for progressive values. Last month in Ohio, you said you plead guilty to, quote, being kind of moderate and center. Do you change your political identity based on who you're talking to? No, I think that uh, like most people that I know, I have a range of views, but they are rooted in my values and my experience. You know, I get accused of being kind of moderate and center. I plead guilty. Just for the record, are you a progressive or are you a moderate? I'm a progressive. Going through the emails, um, there were over 60,000 in total sent and received. About half were work-related and went to the State Department, um, and about half were personal, that were not in any way related to my work. When you speak to the public, you say, I turned over everything. That's, for the most part, a direct quote. When you Talk to the public, you say, I turned over everything. 90 to 95 percent of and my work-related emails were in the state system. If they wanted to that, see them, they would certainly have been able to do so. You know what? So. That, that, is, that is maybe the tenth time you have cited that figure today. It is. And I have not heard anyone other than you ever cite that figure. Wh who told you that 90 to 95 percent of your emails were, on the state, were in the State Department system? Who told you that? We learned that from the State Department and their analysis of the, of the emails that were already on the system. The Inspector General report found that less than 1%, less than 1% of State Department emails, record emails, were captured. So they give a number of less than 1% and you give a number of 90%. I have uh, absolute confidence that everything that could be in any way uh, connected to work is now in the possession of the uh, State Department. This pile represents the emails that you sent or received about Libya in 2011, from February through December of 2011. This pile represents the emails you sent or received from early 2012 until the day of the attack. There are 795 emails in this pile. We've counted them. There are 67 emails in this pile in 2012. And I'm troubled by what I see here. I can only conclude by your own records that there was a lack of interest in Libya in 2012. 
Uh, the server contains uh, personal communications from my husband and me. The only time I got on the Internet, I did two emails, and I ordered Christmas presents from a reservation. <laughs> Otherwise, I found people said embarrassing things on emails. I didn't want to be one of them. <laughs> I mean, and how many angels dance on the head of a pin? I have, I, I have, uh, I have really uh, nothing to, uh, I mean, how do you answer that? I represented Wall Street as a senator from New York, and I went to Wall Street in December of 2007, before the big crash that we had, and I basically said, cut it out. Quit foreclosing on homes. Quit engaging in these kinds of speculative behaviors. Now, who's exactly to blame for the housing crisis? I think there's plenty of uh, blame to go around. Home buyers who paid extra fees to avoid documenting their income should have known they were getting in over their heads. Of course we have to deal with the problem that the banks are still too big to fail. We can never let the American taxpayer and middle class families ever have to bail out the kind of speculative behavior that we saw. But we also have to worry about some of the other players. AIG, a big insurance company, Lehman Brothers, an investment bank. There's this whole area called shadow banking. That's where the experts tell me the next potential problem could come from. So I'm with both Senator Sanders and Governor O'Malley Actually, in putting not. a lot of attention onto the banks. And the plan that I have put forward would actually empower regulators to break up big banks. I represented New York, and I represented New York on 9-11. When we were attacked, where were we attacked? We were attacked in downtown Manhattan, where Wall Street is. I did spend a whole lot of time and effort helping them rebuild. That was good for New York, it was good for the economy, and it was a way to rebuke the terrorists who had attacked our country. 9-11 was bad. I agree with that. Time and time again, you hear one thing in speeches, and then you see a campaign that has the worst kind of tactics, reminiscent of the same sort of Republican attacks on Democrats. Well, I am here to say that it is not only wrong, but it is undermining core Democratic principles. Since when do Democrats attack one another on universal health care? I have looked at, I've looked at the legislation that Senator Sanders has proposed, and basically he does eliminate the Affordable Care Act, eliminates private insurance, eliminates Medicare, eliminates Medicaid, TRICARE, Children's Health Insurance Program. Just because Senator Obama chose not to present a universal health care plan does not give him the right to attack me because I did. So let's have a real campaign. Enough with the speeches and the big rallies and then using tactics that are right out of Karl Rove's playbook. This is wrong, and every Democrat should be outraged. The Democratic Party in the United States worked since Harry Truman to get the Affordable Care Act passed. So shame on you, Barack Obama. It is time you ran a campaign consistent with your messages in public. Hillary Clinton's attempt to tout her foreign policy experience hounded her again on the campaign trail today. I made, uh, you know, I uh, made a, a mistake in, in describing it. I she claimed she times, misspoke I last week and was sleep deprived when she described landing under sniper fire in Tuzla, Bosnia, something that didn't happen. But CBS News has found several times in the past few months when Senator Clinton used the Bosnia trip to try to show her international experience. December in Iowa. You know, we landed in one of those corkscrew landings and ran out because they said there might be sniper fire. I don't remember anybody offering me tea on the tarmac when that was happening. Then in February. The welcoming ceremony had to be moved inside because of sniper fire. And last week. And, uh, I remember landing under sniper fire. We basically were told to run to our cars. Now that is what happened. Just some differing accounts of your trip to Bosnia, and I'm wondering if you can clarify. I know you, you were called, um, you know, ducking under sniper fire, and, and Sinbad in his account was on the trip. He, he said that the most dangerous part was remembering where he was going to eat next. Do, do you He's actually, a comedian, you know, Jeff. <laughs> He's a comedian. So you actually recall, you know, hearing gunfire and were you when we to... were when we were flying into Bosnia, we came in in a uh, evasive maneuver. Um, there was no greeting ceremony. 
and we basically were told to run to our cars. Now that is what happened. After CBS News video showed what really happened when she landed and greeted officials, Senator Clinton maintained there were risks, but explained to the Philadelphia Daily News why she was seen on the Bosnian tarmac greeting a young child if it was really so dangerous. I was also told that the greeting ceremony had been moved away from the uh, tarmac, but that there was this eight-year-old girl, and I said, well, I have, I can't, I can't rush by her. I've got to at least greet her. So I greeted her, I took her stuff, and I left. Now that's my memory of it. Good to see you. Once again, her memory doesn't match our videotape. <laughs> she and her daughter Chelsea lingered on the tarmac to greet U.S. So military officials, took photos. There was the group of seventh graders on the tarmac, too. And then Senator Clinton walked to the armored vehicle where she did eventually dock and enter. It was one of the highlights of President Clinton's first term, passage of the North American Free Trade Agreement, also known as NAFTA. Critics blame NAFTA for the loss of manufacturing jobs in industrial states, including Ohio and Pennsylvania. Hillary Clinton helped get NAFTA approved. She held at least five meetings to strategize about how to win congressional approval. She helped the White House block opposition from labor and environmental groups, and she was the featured speaker at a crucial meeting. Participants in that event said, quote, her remarks were totally pro-NAFTA. There was no equivocation for her support for NAFTA at the time. You know, I have been a critic of NAFTA from the very beginning. My concerns about NAFTA expressed years ago have been well uh, documented and verified. I didn't have a public position on it. I have spoken uh, consistently uh, against uh, NAFTA. And if you look at what I have been saying, it has been consistent. I have been consistent. You can go back and look at from the very beginning. I was one of the voices in the administration warning about NAFTA. You said it was good on balance for New York and America in 2004, and now you're in Ohio, and your words are much different, Senator. The record is very clear. Well, I, I, you don't have all the records because you can go back and look at what I've said consistently. Oh, I think that uh, everybody is in favor of free and fair trade, and I think that uh, uh, NAFTA is proving its worth. I think on balance, NAFTA has been good for New York and America. Was NAFTA a mistake? NAFTA was a mistake to the extent that it did not deliver on what we had hoped it would. Your opponents are saying that that's really part of a larger pattern with you, that you often avoid taking firm positions on controversial issues. <laughs> um, 